Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center. And I would like to welcome you to our webinar on focusing on reducing rural roadway departures. Um, we have built this as our roadway departure webinar. Um, and I, we have our partners from Federal Highway who are joining us as presenters today. We have Dick Albin and Kathy Satterfield who I'll be turning things over to in just a moment. I um, wanna go over a couple of housekeeping items with you real quickly. The first housekeeping item is that we have a handouts pod. In that handouts pod, you should find the slides for today's presentation and also the webinar series announcement for the upcoming series that will be delivered through the Ohio LTAP Center via Ray Brushheart. Um, we also have a question pod and in that question pod, I would ask that you please use that um, throughout the webinar to ask questions you have of the presenters, but to make sure that um, you can hear me right now, if you wouldn't mind, just drop a hi or hello in that question pod so I know that you're able to find it and that you know where it's at here on the screen. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to both Dick and Kathy so they can start moving you through the information. Thanks. Thanks, Victoria. Hi, um, so I'm Kate Satterfield and I work in Federal Highway's Office of Safety in our headquarters office and um, Dick is in our resource center and the two of us are leading an effort um, in what Federal Highways calls our Everyday Counts program. And our initiative is the focus on reducing rural roadway departures. So we're hoping um, that through the webinar today, you'll see um, where what your role is in um, reducing these um, serious crashes on the roadways that you have oversight of. Okay, so we're gonna start out with kind of why do we have this emphasis and um, usually just kind of starts with the data. So um, for the US traffic fatalities, we tend to see about 35,000 um, fatalities annually overall. And in Ohio, yours um, are about 1,000. And if you look at the split between rural and urban, it's um, it's about half and half, a uh, little bit uh, more urban in um, Ohio, a little bit uh, it's pretty close to half and half nationally. Um, and the thing that's unusual about this, it, it kind of seems like it's even, but if you think about um, how many people live in rural areas in the U.S., it's less than 20 percent. So um, rural crashes are actually overrepresented. So it's it's a an issue that we're trying to figure out. You know how can we uh, address that? Seems like something we should be able to get at. And when we look a little closer at those rural crashes, we find that two thirds of those are um, roadway departures, uh, which basically is one third of all traffic fatalities are roadway departures from rural area. So it seems like something that's really important. We need to try and address. So just to make sure we're all on the same page about what a roadway departure is, um, FHWA defines it as a crash in which a vehicle crosses an edge line, a center line, or otherwise leaves the traveled way. And so uh, I think that's a very similar definition that Ohio uses. And the, the key thing to remember there is that a lot of people just think of runoff road crashes when they hear the term roadway departure. And yeah, it does include that type of crashes. So you see a lot of rollovers or crashes with trees or other fixed objects, but it also includes crossing a center line um, or crossing a median. So we see a lot of head-on crashes in this type of um, crash category. Matter of fact, when you look at the most harmful event in our fatalities nationally, um, it's about almost a quarter of them are head-on collisions. So um, we think it's important for every state to consider it, and um, there are states that are more rural than Ohio, and you'll see that they have very high percentages of their crashes are these rural roadway departure fatalities. Um, Ohio, you know, they're kind of in the lower half of 
where all the states sit in this um, breakdown, but when you look at the, the number of fatalities in each state, you'll see that Ohio actually is um, closer to, you know, they're in the upper half now. So that's really important for Ohio to be thinking about this. And um, so statistics, you know, they they tell the story, but they're not very personal. And so we like to bring it home and kind of make people think about the fact that, you know, it could be your friends and family. And when we say 12,000 people die every year in a rural roadway departure crash, it seems like such a huge number, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around it. So try to bring it down to a level you can kind of understand. And it's every single day, 30 people are dying in a rural roadway departure. And they're not just statistics. They could be your friends, your neighbors, um, your family. So it's really important. And since 334 people on average die in Ohio every year, that kind of brings it down to about one person dying every day in Ohio. So we wanted to uh, hear a little bit about what you're already doing to reduce rural roadway departures. So if you could um, respond in the chat pod and kind of give us an idea of some of the things you're doing. And then Victoria is gonna let us know um, what some of your answers are. And actually your screen must have been shared earlier because we got two responses already. Um, so for those of you who haven't responded yet, please feel free to put it in. But we have uh, on two lane roads placing center line and edge line rumble stripes. We use Safety Edge in our resurfacing project. We install center line and edge line when possible. Updated our curve warning sign recently for all roadways with ADT of 1,000 or more. Um, edge line striping, safety edge, rumble strips, edge line and center line, rumble stripes, safety edges, life lights. So that's what I've got in there so oh, those far. Are awesome. That, those are great answers, and I'm so glad to hear so many of our different countermeasures are being used and also great to hear that people actually know what a roadway departure is because I think our last webinar we had a lot of discussion about roundabouts in the chat pod. <laughs> Couldn't quite figure out why. And I like that life light one. So because that is a rural issue is um, how far uh, the people are from um, services when there's injuries. So life light's a, another good one. Well, I think we'll go ahead and um, go on, but feel free to keep um, putting any additional ideas in the chat pod. Um, did did you get any new ones, something that hadn't been mentioned before, Victoria? Um, let's see, the Township Sign Safety Grant Program, um, recessed wet Great. reflective pavement markings, six inch edge lines. That's great. All good roadway departure countermeasures. All right, so Ohio um, at the statewide level has a Strategic Highway Safety Plan or SHSP um, that is uh, trying to move towards zero death and I love your tagline. Um, oops, <laughs> didn't mean to switch there. Um, every move you make towards zero death, I, that's a, a great tagline. Um, so there's goals in the, the statewide plan that is looking at trying to reduce the number of fatalities the fatality rate and also to try and reduce serious injuries. Um, and then there's emphasis areas that do get at uh, the serious crash types, including roadway departure. So Ohio at the state high, statewide level is trying to focus on it. And we can um, see by your answers that you guys have already started focusing on it as well. So with our initiative, um, we call it FORWARD focus on reducing rural roadway departures. Um, our mission is to reduce the potential for serious injury and fatal roadway departure crashes on all public roads by increasing the systemic deployment of proven countermeasures. And we have four pillars that we've kind of built this initiative on. Um, one is the proven countermeasures, and you guys mentioned several of those that you've been installing. Um, we, we definitely have ways to address these types of crashes. Um, not every countermeasure necessarily works on every road. 
um, but there's a lot of flexibility within them. So usually there's some way to address the, the core um, concept of a countermeasure on almost any type of road. Uh, another pillar is to use the systemic approach, and that's because what we find with roadway departure crashes especially is that um, the location of the crashes seems almost random. It, it's kind of, you know, when a driver happens to get distracted, it's often hard to find hot spots where you're having several um, crashes. So using the systemic process to analyze um, crashes and your roadway features that are leading to the type of crashes really helps. And also when you get, get to the level of countermeasures, considering low cost ones that you can spread across your system. Um, and so a third pillar is safety action plans. And so that's kind of taking the, what you've come up with for countermeasures that you think you can apply and after analyzing where you think you need them, you got to put together some kind of plan of, um, of what am I going to do to make this um, happen. I have a goal to reduce roadway departures, what do I do with that? And then the final pillar is actually the first one we're going to get into a little bit more detail on is we need to address it on all public roads. And the reason for that is that um, it's not just a problem on the state system. Our, um, a lot of our programs tend to focus on some of the higher volume systems, what we kind of consider sometimes more important roads like interstates or principal arterials just because they have so much more traffic. Um, but if you look at the breakdown of fatalities, and this is at the national level, um, what we find is that um, those classes that are kind of, that are the blue colors um, on the right half of the screen uh, of the pie chart, um, those tend to be under the jurisdiction of the state for the most part. And the ones on the left half of the pie, the green ones, tend to be um, in general under the um, jurisdiction of local agencies. So almost half of them being under the local jurisdiction means that the state can't solve this problem alone. They really need um, locals to step up and, and uh, address these crashes on the roads that are under their jurisdiction. So honing in on Ohio, um, we've uh, got some data from the state about um, the, the center line mileage is kind of rounded data in that pie chart there that kind of gives you a breakdown. And you see that, of course, it's not surprising that a lot of the crashes are on the um, local system because very much of the road is maintained by local agencies. Um, and the uh, serious injuries, 62% of those are on local roads and 55% of fatalities. So um, even though a lot of the volume of traffic might be on those state roads, um, it's not something we can just look at those roads. We have to look at everything. And when you bring it down to the level of roadway departure, serious injuries and fatalities, um, you know, 55% of those occurring on local roads, and you can see the split is um, <clears throat> of those of that percentage. So about a quarter of all roadway departure um, are occurring on county, and uh, almost as many on the city, and fewer on the township roads. Okay, so. If we're going to address all public roads, how do we actually do that? <laughs> so there's some examples of some what some states have been doing that we're going to cover as we go through the um, the uh, webinar today. One of the key things is that locals don't always have a lot of funding available to address the problems on their roads. So getting funding that is available to them and finding um, good ways to to help them do things like access data that they may not have or even have providing some help um, and expertise compiling and summarizing data is um, things that have been very successful. Um, 
project development is sometimes something that local agencies need help with and, and some other things that have been very successful is states procuring materials for local agencies and also providing contract assistance. Okay. So in Ohio, um, you, the, um, there's been several things to try and get that um, assistance out to the local agencies and this is um, something that definitely has been acknowledged in the, the SHSP that Ohio has. Um, so they have quite a bit of money that they set aside um, for the County Engineers Association to um, distribute to um, county projects. There's also um, safety action plans that have been funded and you can see on the map that um, there's been some regional ones as well as some county ones. The Township, township Signing Program, which apparently at least some of you know about because that was one of the answers we heard in the chat pod. And then the GCAT tool um, to help uh, make it easy for um, crash data to be accessible and mappable. Um, and then also the simplified project application form. And I know that's something I'm really glad to hear you guys have in Ohio because we've definitely uh, been working with states that um, where the local agencies really struggle with having to fill out the form and compete for um, funding for projects. Okay, so we have another poll question Victoria is going to bring up. Um, and we wanted to hear um, which of these your agency has used to reduce roadway departures. And you can select multiple in this case. Um, there's developed a safety action plan, installed roadway departure countermeasures, used the GCAT tool to identify locations, um, using simplified project application form or bundling projects. And they're voting. It's interesting to see all the percentages going up and down. Um, we are hoping to have at least 80% response and we don't record your answers. So please, you know, just go through and get your vote in so that way we can have a good representation of what's going on from those who've joined on the webinar today. The, someone has put in the question box, they can't click on the squares. Um, you, I believe yesterday we found out that if you're in full screen mode, you actually have to exit out of full screen mode in order to um, respond on the, the poll. So hopefully that helps you. And somebody said all of them. So please just go ahead and click on all of them then. You can do that. <laughs> all right. We're we're up there. I'm going to go ahead and close it out and read the percentages off because our the software doesn't allow our presenters to actually see what the results were or even the poll question actually. So um, developed a safety action plan is 43 percent. Installed roadway countermeasures such as edge lines or curve lines is 74. Using GCAT is 76. Using simplified project application form is 23 and bundled projects is 22. So I'm going to go ahead and hide those responses. Thanks. That's great. That's good. So you guys have all, uh, quite a few of you have been doing uh, many of these different things. I was wondering if we were going to get any bundled projects because we hadn't really talked about what that was. And I know um, some people kind of have different ideas in their head about what that means. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand it over to Dick to uh, take the next section. All right. Uh, yeah, my name is Dick Albin. I think, Victoria, you're going to change and allow me to take over the screen. And Yep, you should be able to accept it now. There we go. OK. All right. Uh, yeah, my name is Dick Alpin. I'm with the Resource Center, and I'm going to be talking about the next pillar, uh, the, the systemic approach uh, to uh, uh, addressing roadway departures. But I want to start off uh, with uh, having you think back about a time where maybe you have left the road. 
Um, most people have at one point in their lives have been in a vehicle that's left the road for some reason, whether you cross the center line or straight onto the shoulder or maybe left left the roadway uh, completely. Uh, so think back about a time and think about why is it that you left the road? What, what was the reason uh, that your vehicle ended up leaving the road? Now, it usually comes down to one of about four areas, uh, a reason so I, why somebody left the road. It might be something to do with the roadway. Uh, maybe there's a very sharp curve uh, that has um, that surprises a driver, uh, and they don't uh, turn their wheel or slow down, and they end up leaving the road. Maybe that that curve has poor friction uh, uh, on the on the pavements, uh, so when it's wet, it, it causes them to leave the road. Uh, but those are all things that might be to do with the roadway. Uh, that there's something. Hey, we can fix on the roadway uh, to make uh, make that cr type of crash less likely. Um, another reason why somebody might leave the road is something on their vehicle fails. Uh, you could have a tire blowout or a couple years ago ignition switches were fa uh, failing and turning off and uh, then you don't have any steering. So it's something to do with the vehicle that fails that causes people to leave the road. It could be that you're trying to avoid a, a crash. Maybe uh, a vehicle in front of you slows down so you decide to go off uh, off the road to avoid that crash or maybe a deer jumps out in front of you and you don't want to hit the deer. Uh, so uh, uh, you decide to, uh, uh, in that split second, you decide to uh, take your chances on the roadside. But the majority uh, of issues, that, that uh, reasons why people leave the road, generally have to do with some type of driver error. That, that uh, something that the driver was doing, maybe or not doing, uh, maybe they were driving too fast or not paying attention. Uh, they were distracted, maybe it's driving under the influence. Those are all things that kind of get chalked up to driver error. Um, now, now I, I asked you to think back about a time when you left the road. We're going to bring up another poll for you, and I'd like you to indicate uh, what is the reason that your vehicle uh, left the road. Um, let's see, it looks like the poll is open. So this first uh, poll question, we're asking you, why did your vehicle leave the road? Was it a roadway condition, a, a vehicle component failure, uh, trying to avoid a crash, or was it driver error? And again, we're not recording who says anything, so you can say driver error and be honest if you want. And while they're voting on that, we do have a question that came in to the question box. This has there been an increase in fatalities resulting from texting? Yeah. Um, I, I think that distracted uh, uh, driving and, and including texting is something that is on the rise. I don't have the numbers for you right now. Um, you know, there's, you know, um, you know, if you look at the trend lines, uh, you know, generally we've had some things that have gone down since about 15 years ago. We were in the 40,000s for for fatalities, and now we're into the 30. 38,000 for fatalities. So we generally have been on the decline now, um, but but there are certain things that are, that are increasing as well, and I think distracting driving is one of those. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any specific numbers for you on that, though. Yeah, it, um, we um, just shared the results from the poll, so let me read those off to you. Roadway condition was 34. Vehicle component failure was 1%. Collision avoidance was 25, and driver error was the highest at 41%. I'll hide those okay. results. Thank you. So not not surprising. And now now I'm going to ask you one more question, um, and that is, when you did leave the road, what happened uh, uh, when you left the road? Uh, did you run off the road and you recovered uh, and were able to come to a stop or maybe regain control? Were you alerted by a rumble strip uh, that told you that you were leaving the road and that allowed you to, to regain control? Or did you have a more serious type of a crash where maybe the vehicle rolled over or maybe a head-on crash or hitting a fixed object? And while folks are answering that, um, for those of you who may have joined a few minutes after we got started, we are taking questions to the question box today. I'm not going to be monitoring the raised hands or um, 
unmuting folks that way because we do want to make sure we cut down on background noise. So if you have a question, please feel free to enter it in the question box and I'll be happy to read it off to the presenters. Um, someone stated stuck in the snow and needed assistance getting the car back onto the roadway. There you go. Very good. All right, we're there, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share our results. We have 65% recovered safely, 20% were alerted by a rumble strip, 1% rolled over, 1% had a head on or side swipe, and 14% hit other fixed object. I'll hide those results okay. and then it's all yours again. Thanks. Yeah, and, and I'm glad to uh, see that rumble strips maybe uh, averted some of uh, the more serious type crashes. Uh, hopefully the, the folks that were in the rollover and head on and hit fixed object, uh, hopefully those were not uh, severe injuries, but uh, but that, that kind of gives you an idea. And again, you know, this is something that could happen to, to anyone. Um, uh, so um, now when we look at data, this is a, a, a study that was done at one point to look at the cr contributing causes to crashes. And what they found was that over 90% of crashes had some type of driver error related to it. About a third of the uh, crashes had some type of roadway a contributing factor, and about 13% had some type of vehicle contributing factor. So, you know, as, as we should, saw in our poll, driver error is really the biggest issue that we have. Um, to be honest, drivers are the weakest link. We make mistakes. Uh, humans make mistakes. So uh, uh, so that gets into you know, how do we go about addressing driver error? Um, and um, I'm going to bring up a, a, another um, graphic here. Uh, this is uh, an area of Ohio uh, that is, I think, just east of uh, Columbus. Uh, you guys probably know it better than I do, uh, stretching across several counties. And if you see the green pins, there's a few of them here on the screen. Those are locations where a fatal crash happened in 2014. Um, so fatal crashes in 2014. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up some other years. So we're going to add some more pins to the map. And I want you to focus in on a rural area of the of the map and just try to look at, if I was to have money to maybe make an improvement in safety, where would I invest that money? Um, so I'm going to go forward and show you the next uh, year. Uh, that's the 2015. We added in the blue dots. And if you look uh, kind of just uh, right of the uh, uh, middle, there's uh, two, uh, a green and a blue dot that are fairly close together. It looks like on Route 564. Um, up in the upper left-hand corner, there's two green dots that are fairly close together. Uh, but So you might say, maybe I should go out and fix that location because there's been two crashes that have happened there, you know, a year apart. Uh, that, that might be a reaction uh, if we're just using crash data. Uh, but if we add in another year, so 2016, we have the red dot. You can see those are pretty well distributed across the area. We had in 2017 the purple uh, pins, and you can see those are pretty well distributed. And then 2018, we have the orange pins. So when you look at this map, you know, except for the couple that I noted before, there aren't any that are really close together where you can say, okay, I'm going to go out and fix this location. I'm going to throw a bunch of money at this location. And I'm going to fix it, and that's going to solve my safety problem. Uh, the fact is that they move around. Uh, and when you think about it, what we said before is most crashes have some type of driver error. And where can driver error occur? It can happen anywhere. And and so it's just a matter of where, how do we go about addressing those crashes uh, when they're happening all over the place. So the, the results from, from going through and, and looking at, 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 you know, where crashes are occurring, it brought us to the conclusion that fatal crash locations tend to be fairly random. Again, they're based on that driver error, uh, and that can happen anywhere. But the fatal crash types are fairly predictable. If you look at your data from year to year, you're going to see certain crash types always at the top. Hit fix objects head-on crashes, rollovers. Um, if you're looking at beyond roadway departure, you might have 
pedestrian related or or uh, or for intersections you might have uh, left turn related or rear end crashes but 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 they the types are fairly predictable so what we try to do then is we try to look at how do we attack the problem uh, and attack the crash types and and not necessarily be tied to where there's been a crash in the past and what that brings us to is what we call the systemic approach um, the systemic approach is codified in federal laws uh, uh, that it is an appropriate way of looking at at safety and what it what it means is that when we're talking about systemic safety improvements they are improvements that are widely implemented based on high-risk roadway features that are correlated to particular crash types rather than crash frequency so again the main point here is we're looking at what are the high-risk fe features that are associated with those crash types? And if we can identify those and then go after the locations where those high-risk features exist on our system, that might be a better way of going about um, um, addressing safety for rural roadway departures in particular. Um, Federal Highways has put together a project selection tool uh, for, for su the systemic approach uh, that's available online. Uh, there's also training that's available. Uh, there's a four-hour uh, training that was developed that is being delivered right now, uh, or it used to be de delivered when we were able to travel. Uh, uh, we'll probably be looking at making that available virtually as well. Uh, but uh, there are resources out there to help you with the systemic approach. Um, now, the systemic approach isn't necessarily a replacement for everything that you've always done. Uh, there's what we call the traditional approach or the hotspot approach where you do look for where there's a concentration of crashes. What we're saying is the systemic approach supplements that uh, by looking at um, where where those risk factors are that we can go after. And it's, it's really probably the better approach, though, when you're looking at rural roadways or local roadways or specific crash types that are very rarely concentrated. Uh, in, in locations, uh, in, in single locations, um, so where the crashes tend to be fairly well spread out. Um, and one of the things that I, I really look at as being the key defining feature of the systemic approach is that when you go through the process and identify those risk factors and then identify the locations that have multiple risk factors, you may end up selecting a location that hasn't had a crash yet. Uh, that that uh, in the last five years that you're looking at, there have been no reported crashes. But maybe it's due, and then maybe it will happen next year. So what our goal here, or what we, one of the things we, we try to reinforce is, you don't have to wait for a crash uh, to occur to make improvements. If there's high-risk features that we can see are, are contributing to crashes, maybe if we address those beforehand, that's where we can really make the, the most gains in reducing uh, those serious crashes. Now, some of the high-risk features, uh, the, the risk uh, uh, factors that you might consider, uh, they might have to do with the roadway. It might be things like lane and shoulder width. Uh, a big one is probably horizontal curve radius. Uh, um, but there's also exposure type factors, such as how much traffic is on the road. Uh, there's also speed related you know, the uh, posted speed or operating speed or, or for curves, especially the speed differential uh, between the tangent approach and the, and the curve. Um, there's also roadside features. Um, some, some agencies have looked at a edge risk assessment or a hazard rating, a roadside hazard rating. Um, those are both trying to kind of qualify or, or you know, give a rating to what is on the road. It might take into consideration steep slopes or presence of fixed objects, uh, things along those lines. Um, if you have other data like presence of trees, things like that, that might also be, be used. Um, so, so anyway, there, there are different risk factors that you might select um, for determining uh, where, where you have high risk features. Now, a question that comes up a lot is, I don't have enough data. Um, typically, a state DOT will have fairly good roadway data. They'll know 
lane and shoulder width and um, maybe they'll have where their curves are and things like that. Uh, they generally have fairly good traffic data um, and, and you know location of where the crashes are occurring. Um, but a lot of times local agencies don't have that, that good of data um, and they might feel like well we don't have the data we can't do this. Um, but that's not necessarily true. Um, you know, you might have more data than you think. Maybe there's a, a data from your enforcement folks or through rate road safety audits. Maybe it's your maintenance folks can uh, help contribute and identify uh, risk locations. And so another quote that we use is a, a Teddy Roosevelt quote is, do what you can with what you have where you are. You know, don't feel like you can't do anything because you don't have a robust data source. You know, try to use the data that you have. Some agencies have gone out and done a, a windshield survey where they were able to qualify the roads with that ed edge risk that I mentioned earlier uh, or, or things like that uh, that was fairly easy for them to put together just by driving through the road. So you, you might be able to do more than you think you can. And you know, when we talk about the systemic approach, we also relate it to other things that we do in, in our life. Uh, one of them, going to a doctor's uh, appointment. You know, I, I go to see our, uh, my doctor once a year. I generally don't go any other time, uh, you know, uh, unless uh, there's something, something bad going on. Um, but um, when I go into the doctor's office, they weigh me and measure me. They take my blood pressure. Uh, they ask me a bunch of questions about my health and my family's health. Uh, they may ask for some blood tests to be done. And all they're doing is they're collecting data. Uh, they're, they're collecting data to see if I have any risk factors. Uh, because if they can say, okay, well, you have a, a family history of heart disease, uh, you have high cholesterol or things like that, maybe there's something that they can do to intervene uh, with an improvement. And it's the same thing with the systemic approach to safety. Uh, if you have curves, you might identify risk factors such as the volume of traffic or what the radius of the curve is. There might be intersections or trap, uh, visual traps in the curve, and I'll mention that before uh, in a little bit. It might be that there has been crashes there. Those all might be possible risk factors. And then they went through, you go through and you look at, here's all of the curves that I have and what curves have those risk factors. In this case, curve A only had one of them. They had high traffic volumes. But curve B had all five. So curve B might be one that you want to make an improvement on uh, and, and on down. So that, that's kind of the an, an analogy for the systemic approach that, that helps you get a, a better feel for what we're talking about. But you know, there are things that we do you know, from a medical standpoint, we uh, I, I take a baby aspirin every day because my brother had a heart attack, um, and uh, uh, I've never had one myself. But you know, you don't have to wait for that that crash to happen to make an improvement. Now, when we look at the rural roadway departure fatalities, this is the national data, uh, and look at what types of crashes they were. What was the most harmful event that happened in that crash? Um, about three quarters of, of the rural road rate departure fatalities come from three crash types, head-on crashes, rollover crashes, and hitting a tree. Uh, there's some other fixed objects there, the utility poles, barriers that we put out there, other fixed objects, but those three make up more than three quarters of all of the rural road rate departures. So those are ones that we might target of how do we address those crashes. And when we look at possible risk factors for those, um, the um, if you look at speed, you know route, routes where the posted speed is 50 miles an hour or greater, you have a lot of the rollovers and head-on trees. Two thirds, uh, two thirds of the tree fatalities happened on roads that had a higher speed, so that might be a, a place to start. When we look at curvature, that's another possible risk factor. Um, here we we show that 44% of the rollovers, about a third of the head-ons, and about half of the tree uh, fatalities happened on a curve. Now the odds are that if you look at your complete system, you don't have that much of your system that's on a curve. You know we have a lot of tangent roadways, uh, a lot a lot of miles of tangent roadways, so th that is overrepresented. 
so it might be if you can't do something on the whole sit, the whole corridor, concentrating on the curves might make might might be the best way of going about it. This is just an example of how a uh, area in Minnesota used a systemic approach. Uh, they they used quantitative measures because they had good data on their curves, and they were able to, to identify that the majority of their severe crashes happened on curves that had a radius between 500 and 1500 foot radius. So again, they had good data. They were able to do that. Uh, and, and, and so when they had a curve that had a radius between the, in, in that range, that ga they gave that a star. And I'll, I'll talk about what the stars mean in just a minute. Um, now, you might also use a qualitative approach. You know, maybe you don't have the data. Maybe you don't know what the ADT is on all, what the traffic volumes are on all your roads or you don't know what the curve radius is on all your roads. You probably have a sense for whether a curve is a fairly flat curve or a fairly sharp curve, or what roads are high volumes or low volumes. So you can use a qualitative approach and put it in ranges, like high, medium, low, or, or flat or sharp curves. Uh, that, that's, that's something that you can do Again, maybe by doing a windshield survey or a Google uh, drive-through on your roads, uh, and that is appropriate and uh, a, a good way of going about it. So one of the qualitative approaches that was used in, in the Minnesota example I'm going to show you is, um, you know, where they had a visual trap. And a visual trap is a, a situation where you have conditions along the road that make it look like the road goes straight, like the utility poles that you see in the picture here, when actually the curve makes the, the road makes a pretty sharp curve, or a turn in this case, uh, where you have to reduce the speed down to 25 miles an hour. Now in this case, mitigation has been put in. This was a picture I took, I, I think on my way to Chillicothe about 10 years ago. Uh, uh, but you can see that the uh, mitigation has already put, been put in. There's signs on both sides of the roadway alerting the driver that this turn is coming up and that they might want to slow down. But if you didn't have those, uh, that then the driver might think that they can just go straight. So having that visual trap might be a risk factor that you decide to use. Another risk factor might be that you have an intersection within a curve, um, and like you see here, because that seems to have increased the, the risk of a crash. Um, and what, what they then did was they took all those risk factors in the spreadsheet, and hopefully you can see that okay, um, where, where they have a list of all of their curves over on the far left, and in the middle there they have where there were crashes. You can see they got different levels of crashes, and there are some crashes that were littered through there. Uh, they had uh, the radius of the curve. So again, that between that 500 and 1500, all the ones that are highlighted in yellow are within that range. So they would get a star. Um, the ADT, they had a, a ADT range. So the ones that had the higher ADTs got a star, whether it had an intersection of the curve or a visual trap. Uh, and what they did then was they totaled up all the stars. And what they found was, is that about 6% of all their curves, about 32 curves in total, had three or more stars. And so those were the ones that they proposed going out and doing something about. So they're not necessarily saying that they're gonna go out and address the total inventory of curves, all 504 curves. They're just gonna address 6% of them to have the highest number of risk factors. And that's where the systemic approach really helps you prioritize where you go out and, and make the improvements. So, so that's the systemic approach. Uh, we have a couple poll questions here where we'd like to get know about your experience using the systemic approach. Um, the first poll question that uh, Victoria will bring up is, what type of experience do you have with the systemic approach? It might be that you've never heard of it until today. Um, it might be that you took some training on it, uh, that you've used uh, qualitative ratings to identify risk factors, uh, and you have identified risk factors. Um, uh, it, and it could be that you've identified improvements where there are no crashes. 
and you can select the, uh, we're asking you to select the most appropriate answer here. I know you could actually select multiple ones, but I just select uh, the one that you think is the uh, most appropriate. And they're voting. We're almost up to 50%. And I'm really glad we're having this webinar because I, I hate to say that the top percentage right now has never heard of it until today. So, <laughs> oh, I know it, it's such an important approach for looking at the roadways because it, it gets to the answer of do we have to wait for a crash to happen before we can make the improvement. And if I exactly, and that's where, time, that. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that that's where I think the real power in the systemic approach is, is that, you know, you don't have to wait for that crash uh, to happen. And, and otherwise, you know, we're, we end up just chasing the ambulance. Um, you know, from site to site, um, and we're never getting in front of it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll up and share the responses. We have 40% that had never heard of it until today, 15 took the training, 9% have used the qualitative ratings, 26% have identified risk factors, and 9% have actually identified improvements where there were no crashes. So I'll hide that. Very good. Okay, yeah, we did have one more. Uh, it asked you what risk factors that you are using. Uh, so those that have never heard of it until today, you probably won't need to vote on this one, but um, the uh, uh, those of you who have, uh, if you could let us know what the risk factors were. And we had we were limited to only five choices here, so we, we had to uh, select a couple, but, uh, um, but we have traffic volume, the speed, curvature, lane and shoulder width, clear zone or roadside rating. And if you had other risk factors, you could answer or you could add that in the question pod or in the, chat pod. There. Yeah, yeah. If you want to add that to the chat pod, that would be great. Yep, I'm happy to read those off, and I won't hold out for eighty percent on this one since a, a good portion of people have never heard of it until today. But all right, I'm going to go ahead and close the responses up now. So if you're going to vote, get your last vote in here. All right, and then share what we received. Traffic volume got 47%. Speed received 58. Curvature received 61. Lane or shoulder width received 51. And clear zone or roadside rating received 35%. So I'll hide those responses, and it's all yours again. Very good. And are there any uh, questions in the in the question pod, um, Victoria? No, that there, we need to... there were no responses in there. So you guys must have picked the right ones for the five answers. <laughs> um, or any questions on anything else? But uh, I think we, we, we right now uh, we're ready to trans over, transition over to Kate for the next section. Um, um, no, no there were no other questions right now, and I will go ahead and get that. Presenter status moved over to Kate. There you go, Kate. You can share your screen now. Okay. So um, that's great that you guys are using um, so many of those risk factors. Um, so we're going to get into talking about the next pillar now, and um, that is action plans. And it's not something that you absolutely have to do. Obviously, it's more important to actually to get those countermeasures on the road because having a plan and letting it sit on the shelf <laughs> doesn't do you a lot of good. But what we found is that putting together an action plan really helps people involve the stakeholders that need to get involved and it helps them prioritize. So it sometimes it seems like it's an extra step that maybe you don't want to do, but it's been really beneficial for agencies that have gone ahead and done that. And the action plans can be done at a lot of different levels. Um, the state already has the strategic highway safety plan. So definitely um, if you have a local plan, you want to be in sync with that state plan and look at um, that as kind of a starting point. But um, it can be, plans can be done at a regional level, and there are at least a few of those plans that have been done in Ohio. Um, 
every agency can do a local plan. Um, there are tribal plans, just a lot of different ways you can do safety action plans. Um, and some of the benefits um, that we've especially seen is it really helps to have something in writing when you're trying to get funding, trying to convince your leadership or trying to um, go to other, say, the state <laughs> to request funding. So um, just that, that planning really uh, makes a difference. So how do you do a local road safety plan? Um, there's probably a million different ways to do it, but some of the key steps as you go through the process is to make sure you look at the stakeholders. So I'm guessing the most of the people we're talking to today in the webinar um, are those who are working in a local agency that has jurisdiction over the roadway. Of course, that's key. That's, um, you know, kind of the, the main people, but there are other people that you want to involve. Um, law enforcement, um, people in the public health system, EMS, uh, there, there's a lot of people who have a stake in safety. So you might want to think outside the box a little bit and, and try and find who are those people to get involved because they might have really great ideas. They may even have funding available that you're not aware of. Um, having them involved in the planning process can really help. Um, using safety data is really important and Dick talked a lot about that in the systemic approach. Um, you don't just because you don't have roadway data, there might be other information available. You might be able to look through maintenance logs. There um, possibly the, so many other stakeholders have information that will help you um, get the data. So it, it is important to use a data different approach, but it doesn't have to necessarily be quantitative. It can be um, just using what data you have because it's, it's really important to just do what you can with what you have. Um, better to do something than to sit around and say, oh, I can't do it because I don't have data. Um, and then you, you need to choose your solutions. What, are you, what type of countermeasures are you gonna use? Um, is it gonna be engineering? That's what we're mostly involved with um, in our initiative, but there's also um, potential for trying to address the behavior side of this. Um, and getting, if you, some of your stakeholders are EMS, maybe that's an issue, especially with rural. We talked a little bit about that earlier, that, um, that there's kind of a golden hour where if you can't get um, people, health services that have been injured in a crash, that it's much more likely to become a more serious injury or a fatality. And then, of course, um, you have to implement the solution and that can take many forms, although we're mostly talking about um, putting something on the roads themselves here. Oh, and I meant to mention there is a video. Um, I think afterwards we'll try and get that uh, a link to that video in the chat pod that talks about local road safety plans. Um, so this map shows um, what Federal Highways knows <laughs> about the status of local road safety plans. Um, it's been something that um, has been going on for uh, many years now, um, but Federal Highways has been involved in um, trying to make it spread. So Minnesota was one of the first states that went out and did local road safety plans, and we'll show you some examples from theirs. Um, Washington also has, um, Washington and North Dakota have also done them. Basically, if you look at the map, the blue is the states that are trying to get um, county safety plans for every single county. And the darker, darkness of the blue gives you an idea of how far along they are. Um, so there's also been a cooperation between NACE and Federal Highways to um, do pilots with some counties in several states, and Ohio is one of those states that was involved. And so there have been several plans um, developed by some of the counties. 
Uh, and so, and then there's other states that have um, done it through other processes. Um, sometimes federal highways has been involved, sometimes not. Um, some of the states are using regional plans as well. But um, if you keep in mind Minnesota and Washington, because we're going to show you some results that they've got from doing their plans. So the Minnesota example, um, they were one of the first ones to realize that um, half of their fatalities were on the state system and half were on other roads and that there was no way they were going to get to zero if they didn't address that. So they, for many years, been um, splitting their HSIP, which is the Highway Safety Improvement Plan funds that they get from federal highways and they basically said well if half of our fatalities are on a local system we're going to try and get half of the fund the safety funds spent on the local system so that's their target that they, they try to reach every year um, and they um, they found that um, many of the local agencies were taking the hot spot approach and would put in big projects to maybe realign a curve or something like that, um, not what the state thought was the best use of funding. So they um, hired a consultant and they had the consultant develop safety plans for each of their counties. Because um, as you see, the counties were the big chunk for them of the local system. Um, so they had the county work, um, review all the roadways, review the data, look at the risk factors, Dick showed you some of those that they considered, and they came up with a plan for each county. And basically, then they streamlined the process, and any county or um, any county that um, submitted a plan or a project that was in their um, county road safety plan, basically, it was a streamlined process, so they almost were guaranteed that they would get their projects funded. And that helped a lot um, in helping those local agencies get over the concept of doing major type of projects like realignments or um, fixing super elevation. And they've gone to a lot of, um, as a matter of fact, the, I think the, the common, the most common thing I've heard they've done is adding two foot of shoulder um, with that allowed them to then put in rumble strips in the safety edge. So that's one of the key things that they've gone out and done. So they're, they've got a streamlined process. They're putting it in on one of the locations that was in their plan um, and, and doing what the plan said. Another thing that um, they've done as they've gone along um, is they found that it can be um, quite quite a process for a local agency to take on a federal um, project. It's not something they're used to that sometimes comes with some extra requirements. So um, they were they actually found that um, if they had nearby counties that were doing the same types of projects, like I mentioned, the say rumble strip projects, they would bundle their projects with other counties. And um, that way, one county engineer managed the project. They got better prices on the project because it was a larger project for the contractor to come in and do the work. Um, and only one of the county engineers had to take on the burden of overseeing the project. And then another county engineer would take on um, the project the following year. So they basically were bundling across counties, which worked really well for them to um, to get better costs on the projects and um, just be more efficient overall. So the uh, the state went in and looked at um, what they what was happening as a result of this, and basically they just tracked the trends for fatality rates across. Um, several years and the blue line at the bottom is the interstate system, the middle line is the state highway system and the, the top line is the county system and what they found was that um, after they um, 
started implementing the countermeasures from the road safety plans, they definitely saw a dip in the fatality rate on the county system that they didn't see on the other systems. The only thing that they could attribute it to was the county road safety plans and implementing those countermeasures. So definitely something that seemed to be working. Another example um, is Washington State. They, their process was different um, to some extent. So their, when they looked at their data, only 30% of the fatalities and serious collisions were on the state system. So they basically decided 70% of their funds needed to go to locals. So they made that commitment. Um, and their um, fatal crash rate is two times higher on county roads than on state highways. So that was a big focus for them, was to focus on the counties. Um, they decided that the county engineers, they, they were lucky enough to have county engineers in every county, which I understand Ohio also has, so that helps a lot. But they don't necessarily have um, a lot of background in doing the crash analysis. So the state provided training, and they also um, provided the crash data, and they actually formatted that crash data. So it was more information that they were giving the counties rather than just a here's how you can access the data. They actually went through and created a spreadsheet and um, broke down the different types of crashes um, and compared the each county to surrounding counties that had similar type of um, traffic and um, geography and things like that that might affect the crashes. So they each county engineer then had good information in their hand to look and say, okay, I think I have problems um, in this area or that area. And so each, um, the county engineers then had the opportunity to develop their own safety plans, unlike Minnesota's where the state actually developed it for them. So the in this case, the county engineers um, went ahead and developed safety plans. Um, it's been going up every year. They're almost complete now. They have 37 of the 39 counties that have developed safety plans. And there's a very wide range. Some of them are only a few pages. Um, some of them are kind of, at, those, those that tend to be at a high level. There are others that are like half an inch thick or more. <laughs> so it, it, you know, it's, it's individualized to the county and the county had ownership of them because they developed them themselves. And that um, was a really good model. So they also have 23 cities that had developed plans. So that's kind of a critical piece of being able to obtain funding for um, safety projects in Washington as well. Oh, and I don't have a slide on it, but um, they also found that they have seen a crash reduction on the county system since they um, started implementing these the the plans. Okay, so um, we're gonna switch over to a poll question to see what is your status with safety action plans. Okay, I've got this poll question put up, and again, we're not recording answers, so please just vote honestly. Let us know. We want to get a good feel for the audience um, with what you know is going on out there. And there was a question that came in earlier about some counties in Ohio that had the um, plans, and two of the counties I know that participated in the, the pilot project were Champaign and Holmes County. So I had put that in the answer box. Um, but Dick and Kathy, are there others that you guys can think of too? Um, I actually have that. Um, I can look that up while Dick's presenting in the next section and get back to you. I'm pretty sure I have that list, <laughs> but I will I just, have to look it up. Yeah, don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I didn't either. <laughs> so. All right, okay. we've got um, almost to 80%. Do you want me to go ahead and show the responses? Okay. Um, Sure. I, I know we, we only asked you to select the most appropriate in this case because the um, 
they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but there's it's in some ways progressive that if you've um, have projects funded through your plan, then you've probably already done some of those other ones. Mm -hmm. So, are well, we are we at eighty percent then? Or yeah, I shared the results. Sixteen percent are actually working from developed county or regional plans. Um, Nine percent have identified data to use. Thirteen percent identified countermeasures. Seven percent have projects funded based on their plan, but fifty-five percent didn't know. So I'll hide those results. Okay, well that 55% I think after this webinar that gives you something to do to find out whether or not your agency is <laughs> working on a safety action plan and uh, if not, start considering whether that would be something that will be useful to you. Um, I know we had a recent peer exchange where we were talking about safety action plans and um, one of the benefits that um, I think it was someone from Texas shared is that they found that even as they were meeting and discussing some of the issues, they included some maintenance people in those discussions. And um, they found that even before they finished writing the plan, the maintenance people had started to implement some of the solutions because they just didn't even know that um, some of the issues and what they could do to help um, reduce crashes. And so, even though, like I said, sometimes people think, well, that's just paperwork. I don't really want to write a plan. There is a benefit to um, to writing those plans. And of course, the benefit is getting more people involved but and having a good way to prioritize and justifying. Um, but the important thing, of course, is actually implementing that plan. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and we'll switch over to Dick to talk about our final pillar. Okay, okay. let me get that moved Yeah, over so as quick. Victoria switches over, um, you know, Kate started out this webinar talking about the four pillars uh, that we, we use in uh, with the Forward Initiative. Uh, we've talked about three of those now. So we've talked about why all public roads, uh, and we've talked about the systemic approach and we've talked about safety action plans. The last pillar is the proven countermeasures. And I'm gonna be um, kind of giving you an overview of the uh, uh, main roadway departure uh, countermeasures that we have available to us. Uh, but I know that Ray Bruchart is going to be um, delivering a few other webinars uh, coming up this month that's going to go in more detail on the on these so I um, uh, just want to I, I saw that those were scheduled uh, throughout the uh, month of May so um, now we generally look at roadway departure uh, and how we deal with roadway departure as three three we have three different objectives uh, the first and foremost is we want to try to keep the vehicle on the road if we can keep all the vehicles on the road, we don't have a roadway departure problem anymore. Uh, and we can do that with things like curve signing, pavement marking, uh, friction treatments, uh, rumble strips. Uh, but we know even if we do all of those, there's still going to be some people that still leave the road. Uh, so then we also look at if they do leave the road, what can we do to reduce the potential that they're going to crash into something, that they're going to encounter something that's going to cause them a problem. Uh, and we, we generally think of things like having shoulders so that you can recover on. Uh, the safety edge, a number of people have mentioned uh, implementing the safety edge earlier on, and that's great. Uh, there's uh, providing a little bit more room in the center line with the center line buffer, and I'll show you what that means in a minute. Um, but also providing a clear zone or traversable slopes along the roads. Um, but we know that we can't always do that. We know that we maybe don't have right of way or, or there's just things that we have to accommodate within our right of way uh, that, that might be fixed objects. Um, so then we have our last objective, and that is what can we do to minimize the severity? We basically accepted that there's gonna be a crash. And, and in fact, there might be more crashes after we're done because if we put in a barrier, which is one of our countermeasures, uh, more people are gonna hit it. It's going to be closer to the road. It's going to be a longer uh, object, a bigger uh, target for people to hit. So there's probably going to be more crashes. So the only way that makes sense is if we're reducing the severity. And what we've basically gotten to is we'll accept having more property damage crashes if we can reduce a couple 
uh, fatal or severe injury crashes. So it's a trade-off. And I'm just going to be running through these at a fairly high level. Um, you know, uh, curve signing, providing chevrons, we've seen the crash reductions of about 25% of nighttime crashes, 16% of the non-intersection crashes uh, by providing that advanced warning sign, uh, the chevrons uh, that delineate the curve. Um, we also have uh, providing uh, edge and centerline markings. Uh, just having uh, uh, edge and centerline markings is an is, uh, improvement. So adding them where you don't have any right now. now if you know the MUTCD, you know there's fairly high ADT thresholds for where you use uh, edge and centerline markings. And a lot of agencies, or most agencies, I think exceed those. Uh, but but um, if you have roads that don't have any edge or center lines, adding them might make a difference. Uh, we've also seen evidence that using wider lines, you know, going up to six inches might have uh, helped reduce the nighttime injury crashes. Um, we also know that that seems to work better with autonomous vehicles uh, that are maybe part of the future. So, uh, so going to wider lines is maybe another thing to consider. Um, providing high friction surface treatments. Uh, this is something that um, you know, particularly for for curves where there's a high friction demand, uh, what happens is that the friction gets worn out uh, because there is such a high demand. And so, what the high friction surface treatment is, it's adding a really hard aggregate that's bonded to the pavement, usually with an epoxy uh, type type solution. Uh, and we found that that has a very uh, large reduction on uh, on crashes. 52% uh, of wet road crashes on curves, um, and uh, and total crashes on curves going down um, uh, by by 24%. So um, I think I heard a few people say that they had uh, tried that out as well. Um, uh, then our, our our last of our uh, countermeasures on keeping vehicles on the road is to use the uh, edge and centerline rumble strips. Um, they can either be placed on the shoulder, they can be put on the edge line, or they can be put in the center line. And we've seen very uh, consistently uh, reports, uh, uh, documentation that those have reduced crashes. Um, now, we we just recently uh, issued a video on rumble strips that kind of uh, talks about uh, the noise. It's called the sweet sound of safety. And uh, I've given that link to Victoria. I don't know if she's uh, been able to uh, share that or not, uh, but uh, that is something that you might take a look at. It's a very, it's a minute long, so uh, it's, uh, but it was intended to try to explain to people why that, that noise that they hear is maybe the really the sound of somebody's life being saved. Now, now, um, I'm moving on to our next objective, and that is to reduce the potential for crashes. And we have several countermeasures that I'll mention here. One is adding a shoulder. Um, you know, not only uh, do shoulders provide that ability for a vehicle to, to recover before they encounter some different slope or, or um, surface, uh, but as you can see on the in the pictures, it also gives the opportunity to add in a rumble strip. So that's compounding the benefit. Um, the crash reductions you see here were adapted from the highway safety manual, uh, and they're based on the difference between having no shoulders, like you see in the top photo, and adding a two foot, four foot, six foot, or eight foot shoulder. And you can see you get fairly good reductions by adding that shoulder. Um, on the edge of the pavement, whether it be at the edge of the shoulder or the edge of the traveled way, uh, one of the uh, countermeasures that we've uh, uh, promoted before as part of an EDC effort is called the safety edge. And it's basically just a way of forming the edge of the pavement so that if you have a drop off occur uh, where, through erosion or wheel pass or, or whatever, and you have a drop off uh, uh, an edge of pavement exposed, now you have a, a beveled edge rather than an abrupt edge. And that makes a big difference for how people might recover or react to the edge uh, when they run off the road. And we've seen reductions of drop off crashes of 34%. 
uh, and fatal and injury crashes of 11%, which is really kind of amazing considering it really doesn't cost anything. It's really just forming the edge of the pavement. Uh, it doesn't really take up more asphalt. It's uh, just a, 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 you know, forming the pavement and it ends up giving you a better edge of the pavement from a structural standpoint as well. Uh, another countermeasure that's maybe new uh, um, to some of you, um, and it's being studied right now as part of an NCHRP project, is just to provide a little bit more buffer area in the middle. If you're having an area where there's head-on crashes uh, that are that are occurring, maybe using uh, reducing the lane widths and possibly the outer shoulder widths to provide some type of buffer area. And the NCHRP project that's looking at that, it's not published yet, but the uh, preliminary results say that if you can provide a two-foot buffer area, you can reduce 35% of your head-on crashes. So that's something that can be done through restriping in some cases. If you have, uh, you know, wider pavement, uh, wider lanes that you can reduce. Another of our uh, countermeasures to reduce the potential for crashes is to establish and maintain a, a clear zone. The clear zone is the area from the edge of the traveled way that's available for the recovery of air and vehicles. And the roadside design guide provides some guidance for what that clear zone uh, is suggested to be. Uh, but it, it isn't a matter that you get all or nothing. Um, you know, it, maybe you can't provide a full width clear zone along all, your, all of your corridor, but maybe pr just increasing the clear zone might provide a reduction. Uh, you can see going from around three feet to around 16 foot feet can provide a 22% a reduction uh, of crashes. Um, and, and providing up to 30 foot can provide a, an even bigger reduction. Um, this is also a case where maybe you can't address the whole corridor, and that's where maybe focusing in on the curves might, might make sense. <clears throat> this was an example that uh, Mike Fitch uh, found for us uh, as we were preparing for this webinar uh, from Clear Creek, Clear Creek uh, Township in Warren County. Um, I don't know if anybody is on from uh, Clear Creek uh, Township, uh, but this was a project that was done, I think, around eight or so years ago, uh, where they had a section of road where they had trees and a deep ditch at the edge of the traveled way. Uh, they had documented eight crashes that involved the ditches, the ditch, the fence, the trees, uh, and so they were able to get funding to uh, make an improvement. Uh, they worked with a farmer uh, along there. They removed the trees. They relocated the ditch. Uh, and what I saw was no reported crashes since 2012. Uh, so that's a very good outcome and with, you know, fairly modest uh, type of uh, activity. And this is just a picture that I found on Google from this area that shows that that, that roadside is a, a pretty recoverable, uh, that if somebody does run off the road there, they, they have a chance of uh, recovering rather than getting into the ditch or hitting that fixed object. And the last of our, our countermeasures for reducing the potential for crashes is to have traversable slopes, which kind of goes hand in hand with the clear zone. Um, when we talk about traversable, those are slopes that are flatter than three to one are, are traversable. It's even better if you can get them to flatter than four to one, uh, but there are crash reduction factors for flattening of slopes that are in the highway safety manual. And then our last objective are, is to minimize the severity. And again, this is where we've accepted that there's probably gonna be a crash. Um, but we want to reduce the severity of that crash. And one of our primary uh, countermeasures is you use a barrier. We can also, you know, for things that we have to accommodate in our right of way, like signs and utility poles, there are designs for those that can be made either uh, energy absorbing or breakaway. Uh, but barriers tends to be one of the more popular uh, solutions. A lot of times it's because you don't have a lot of right of way. And so barriers might be a solution for there. Uh, the picture that you see there shows a, a county road, uh, that not in Ohio. This was in Washington State. But you can see that it, it's on a curve and there's a body of water uh, down below. Um, and uh, th what they did was that they went in and they installed a barrier um, uh, along that road. 
so again, they'll probably have more reported crashes because people are going to run into the barrier and they're going to have damage. But the high severity ones where the vehicles actually got into the water, maybe upside down, uh, we, they should be reducing those by quite a bit. So those are that's kind of a high level overview of our countermeasures. So we have a couple poll questions. Uh, I think these are our last of our poll questions uh, for this webinar. Um, and the first one is, uh, which objectives have you used in applying uh, countermeasures? And you can select all of them that apply, but uh, we have the keep vehicles on the roadway, reduce the potential for crashes, minimize the severity of crashes. I'm afraid I didn't make all of them selectable at once. I'm sorry. Okay. So well, they just have to select well, the one they've used the most, maybe. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, and while Problem. I'm doing that, um, I've got a question for you that came in. It says, what crash data collection and analysis has involved looking at the age of the driver involved? I'm thinking of older drivers with diminished night vision and what measures would help address roadway departure incidences that involve a high percentage of older drivers? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't, I, I know that there have been studies of looking at older drivers, but you're right, vision is an issue. So uh, larger signs, sometimes, uh, you know, you can you can upsize your, your signs so that it's a little bit easier for the drivers to see. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, um, you know, making sure that your pavement markings are retroreflective so they show up uh, good for the driver. Uh, Kate, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, retroreflectivity is going to be a key thing for um, as far as the vision, which is probably the largest component of the issue for um, older drivers when it comes to roadway departure. And when it comes to intersections, it's, some of it is like being able to look over their shoulder and um, making left turns and stuff. But and when it comes to roadway departures, uh, retroselectivity is probably one of the, the top things, just making sure your devices are visible. I have um, stopped that poll and sh shared the results. So I wanted to let you know, um, keep vehicles on the roadway got 38%, reduce the potential for crashes 41%, and minimize severity 21. Pretty balanced uh, overall, so that's good. Now we have one more poll for you asking what specific countermeasures uh, that help keep the vehicle on the road. So uh, since we had to limit the five possible responses, we just went with the ones to keep the vehicle on the road. So uh, we have curve signing, uh, pavement markings, uh, friction treatments, and rumbles. And, and I, they can't, we they were, can't vote uh, for more than one on here. Okay, so you, you can you can select them all if you like. Yes, absolutely. I did it the right way this time. And while that one is going, I wanted to read off a comment that came in from one of our um, district safety engineers. That it was back when you were talking about high friction surface treatment. It says, well, um, high friction surface treatment is very effective. It is also very costly. There are several other countermeasures for friction improvements that should be considered before moving directly to high friction surface treatment in their opinion. So I think this gets back to conversations I know that Dick, you and, and Kate and I have had about um, Ohio doing you know, different grindings um, before they move into that, what we consider more of a Cadillac treatment as far as high friction surface treatment. Yeah, yeah. And, and a and lot of times, the, the big thing. Um, go ahead, Dick. You go. You can go. <laughs> I was going to say the it it is uh, more expensive per square foot, but when you're looking at curve crashes, um, you're you're talking about doing a fairly small section of pavement. So, um, HFST actually makes sense because it is way it, it provides so much more friction and it's an area where you need the friction and the friction wears down really fast so it it, it seems really expensive and it's not that nothing else works but it it lasts so much longer that if you look at it over the um the length of the life of how long it will last it might still be the most cost-beneficial way to go. 
And, and there's, of course, other things you need to take into consideration because you don't want to place it on um, a pavement that is cracked or has other um, maintenance issues. One more but, question. But it is very, I was going to say the same. I, I was going to say the same thing. It's it the, really the high friction gives you the durability. So uh, it's something that that you can you know we can see uh, high friction surface treatments maintaining the friction for say ten years, whereas the other treatments might wear out uh, because of the friction demand. So it, there is that balance uh, that you need to look at uh, and looking at it from a life cycle uh, concept. But um, anyway, did Victoria, did you have results? I do. The results, I've posted those, and curve signing and pavement marking came in even at 76%. Those are the most selected. Friction treatments came in at 40%, rumbles at 62%, and 13% chose uh -huh. other. Okay. So, all right, all right. Well, there's um, a couple of other items referring to the the conversation around high friction surface treatment came into the question pod. I'll just read those off real quickly. Um, I consider micro milling for a friction treatment. Um, they were asking about the safety engineer just considering microsurface as a friction treatment. And then someone else said microsurfacing contractors consider their product a high friction surface treatment. And this person wanted to know if um, Dick and Kate, if you guys agreed, and then someone else commented, super elevate the curve equals a counter at measure. So those are the items in the question box right yeah. now. Okay, so let me uh, try to, uh, I'll, let me deal with the super elevation first is, yeah, a, a lot of roads might not have been designed that they were just paved and maybe they don't have super elevation. And one countermeasure that you might consider is providing that super elevation. Now, the trade off on that is when you do that, what the, impact on how people drive it might change because people might feel more comfortable driving it faster and so you might have speeds go up what, what but what friction does is it it provides the increased um, ability to keep the vehicle on the road but without making feel more comfortable with it so uh, so that that's one thing to consider with super elevation but super elevation is 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 something that could be considered um, the the micro milling to provide a texture on the pavement that will provide you know friction and increase friction in the short term, but the odds are it's going to wear down. Uh, so the the key with high friction surface treatments, as we refer to it, uh, is that that it's the uh, calcined bauxite aggregate on an epoxy uh, uh, being held on to the pavement with epoxy and that's what we think will give you a more durable longer lasting friction um, so uh, in increased friction with milling absolutely it's just how often are you going to need to do it right and and okay. there's certainly lots of friction options out there and and I think they're great for longer sections of roadway where you might have issues um, when it comes to curves, I think that's where you're talking about a specific kind of short section that you're going to be addressing, and it might be worth investing more to get that higher durability because that is the place where the, the um, friction is going to wear quicker as well, and it's where it's most needed. So that, that's why it's worth considering it in those locations. Um, so I wanted to All right. circle back. Okay, go ahead. Oh, were you done, Dick? <laughs> I was going to circle back to some of the other questions we got, but I'm not sure if you're finished. Sorry. I just have a slide to kind of start winding down. So uh, if you want to circle back, that's fine. Okay. So um, for the local road safety plans, um, the ones I know about are Champaign County, Delaware, Franklin, and Holmes. And almost positive there's one more that I don't have which agency. I think it might be a city or a township, though. Okay. Any, were there any other questions of Victoria? 
sorry, I had myself muted. Um, no other questions, <laughs> but there was a comment about the fact that we have had your colleague Mark Doctor here, um, and he did a, an in-person training on designing and operating roads for the aging population. So maybe since that's been a couple of years, I'll circle back to Mark. You can warn him that I'll be calling to see if he might be willing to do a webinar for us on that topic. I'll let him know. All right. Well, um, you know, so I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'm still in control. Um, I just, uh, you know, kind of winding down a little bit. Um, as part of the EDC initiative, we are uh, putting out uh, some webinars. We're doing one a month. Uh, we started in April. Uh, we had one on developing development of projects and using data. And we did have uh, Stephen McCall from Champaign County was one of our presenters on that webinar. Um, and that's where I got some of the photos uh, that I, I used in there uh, in the webinar today. Um, our next one is coming up on May 12th. Uh, we're going to talk about innovative mechanisms to deliver safety. Uh, that's going to include a presentation from Montana on uh, work order contracting, as well as um, uh, some presentations from uh, Maine and Mississippi on things that they're doing to help uh, by procuring signs and things like that, similar to what your, your township sign program is. Um, uh, then in uh, June and July, we're going to have a couple that are, are on the systemic approach. Uh, the first one will be addressing risk factors, uh, next one on how to prioritize locations and projects. And then we're going to have three on the countermeasures, um, you know, getting in specific on the countermeasures uh, in August, September, and October. And then we have one more that will be talking about safety action plans. Um, and uh, it may look like we're discounting safety action plans but we're actually talking about action plans in each of the ones above it. So, uh, so we'll be talking quite a bit about uh, safety action plans, local road safety plans uh, as we go through. Um, so hopefully uh, you, you'll be able to make it to that as well as the uh, ones that Ray is gonna be uh, delivering for you uh, this month uh, uh, specific to this, this topic. And that's what I have. Uh, if there's any other questions, so we can take them now. Uh, I'll go ahead and put up our contact information uh, that if you have any questions uh, that, that came from this webinar that you'd like for more information, you can contact us. Uh, I sent uh, Victoria a couple videos. Uh, one is an overview video that kind of kind of went over the forward initiative in general. Uh, we also had one on local road safety plans uh, that, that you might find interest in. And then we also have the video on the rumble strips so that I sent links to. I don't know if those were sent out or if I couldn't see those or not, but uh, those are links that you can take a look at uh, if you have interest. Other than that, I'm willing to take uh, any, any questions that we are remaining. You know, there aren't any questions in the box, so um, I'll just remind everybody I did forward those links, including links to register for the upcoming webinars that you guys are providing um, in the chat pod. So I want to say thank you so much for providing this webinar for us. It has been fantastic information, and hopefully, you know, with the information that has now been received, we'll be able to continue moving towards that zero deaths goal. So Kate and Dick, thank you so much for your time on this. And thank you all for being a part of the webinar. Um, you have their contact information, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up now and everybody stay safe. Take care. Great. Thank you all. Thanks.